Oh, good snowy evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Professor Murphy and I'd like to welcome you to the final Burgess Lecture for 2014. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce a special guest uh, who's here tonight, Jim Burgess and his sister Anne as well. Um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about Jim and Anne's, uh, uh, how this lecture series came to be and through their, uh, gener as a direct result of their generosity and foresight. Um, Jim Burgess worked with Dean Carolyn Wu to permanently endow this series honoring their late father, Jack Burgess, who passed away in August. Uh, through Jim's uh, gift, this series enables us to bring current and important dimensions of ethics uh, to life through the distinguished uh, speakers who participate. This adds a dimension beyond the classroom and we all gain a tremendous insight from the lectures. Uh, Mr. Burgess is a partner at uh, Clayton uh, Dubier and Rice and joined the firm in 2006 as a member of the investment committee. Previously, he was chairman and president uh, of Emerson Electric for a number of years prior to Emerson. I think like your father, uh, Jimmy worked for General Electric, and he's a Notre Dame uh, graduate of the Engineering College and a longtime member of the Business Advisory Council. And please expend a warm Irish welcome and thank you to Jim and his sister Ann Pillay. And before we get started, I think it's uh, only fitting that we have a moment of silence uh, to remember and honor their father, Jack, who is a, a real advocate of business ethics and after whose uh, name the lecture series uh, uh, has, has resulted. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker for uh, this evening, Ann Nobles, who's retired from Eli Lilly and Company, uh, recently as Senior Vice President of Enterprise Risk Management and Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer. And under Ann's leadership, the company entered into and complied with a corporate integrity agreement, the Office in Inspector General, and strengthened the global privacy program, substantially enhanced uh, Lilly's anti-corruption program. She chaired the company's compliance committee and served on the company's executive uh, committee. During her more than 22 years with Lilly, Ann served in a series of roles of increasing importance, including the vice president of corporate affairs. Affairs. Currently, she's chairman of the board of directors of IU Health, one of the largest, it is the largest health system in Indiana and one of the top rated in the country. She's vice chair of the board of directors for Citizens Energy, Indianapolis-based utility, and she also devotes time to nonprofit causes such as the Nature Conservancy, and received her BA and MA from Harvard and her JD from Georgetown Law School. Anne, welcome, and we look forward to your lecture. Pat, thank you very much, and I want to thank the Burgess family for endowing this lectureship. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for students to be um, exposed to different views about ethics, and in my case, ethics and compliance. As Pat mentioned my uh, principal experience in this area is as a result of my work at Eli Lilly and Company over the last 22 years, but also as a foundation for my experience is the four years I spent in Indiana state government early in my career as an appointed official and then as a lawyer trained at Georgetown. But like you, I've had experiences in childhood that have really guided my thinking about ethics and so I'd like to share those with you as well. But let me first start and, and describe how I'm going to frame ethics tonight. Because in my job, I had responsibility for both ethics and compliance. Compliance, in my view, is meeting the expectations of the law. And uh, that uh, can vary from company or organization to organization. But to me, that has to be a strong foundation for any company. I think it would be hard for a company to be considered ethical if it fails to comply with the law. But I think it's rare that a company that is merely compliant is going to be considered ethical. Because to me, ethics is when you go beyond the legal requirements. And to me, that has to be a, 
uh, explicit decision that a company or individual makes to forego either a, an interest or profits, but a, any kind of benefit that the per person foregoes to me would be a decision made to establish an ethical principle for that individual or company. So let me return to my childhood. I was born in Amarillo, Texas, in the Panhandle, where it's snowing right now, just like it is here. And um, my father, too, was born in Amarillo and spent, has spent nearly all of his life there. He's 89, and he still lives there. But um, he studied um, law and was a, a practicing lawyer early in his career. And, in the, and then in the mid-60s, he was appointed to fill an unexpired term as a judge in Amarillo. Now, having grown up in Amarillo, Daddy obviously had a lot of friends in that community, and so when the holidays came around, he was sent several gifts by people who hadn't sent gifts before. Um, my sister and I were particularly interested in one because it was a pass to one of two movie theaters in Amarillo. That's how small Amarillo was at the time. But it was to any movie that was showing at that theater for two people. My sister and I thought we were the perfect ones to be able to take this pass and make good use of it. So as we were busy planning how we were going to use the movie pass, my father returned it along with the other gifts that he had gotten. And in a couple of cases, it was somewhat awkward for him because these were childhood friends who'd sent gifts and they were offended that he would return them. And he said, look, as a judge, I have to have the, the ability to make decisions that will be unpopular with some people and I, my decisions have to be beyond reproach. And so I'm not in a position to accept gifts um, from, from people who might have an interest before my court. And I found out years later that he had even taken that, that um, position to campaign contributions. Uh, he would accept them until he knew that he wasn't going to have an opponent, and then he returned them. And my father was in the enviable position of never having had an opponent. The politics were pretty different back then. Um, at the time that, that I saw the movie pass being returned, it was hard for me to understand why my father had taken that position. Of course, as I got older, it became very clear. And um, it really um, infused in me the sense that you had to be paying attention to how your actions affected other people or how they would appear to affect other people. And I think the proof for me of the value of his very strong position, because at that time there weren't codes of conduct for judges, there weren't any limitations on gifts at that time, but. Um, the, the benefit of having had that very high standard for himself, I think, paid off because not too long ago, the paper in Amarillo wrote an article talking about the, the two judges that they felt like had really upheld um, the, the values and principles that were important for a judge and that, that decided cases fairly and honestly. And my father was singled out as one of those people. And this was years and years after he had retired. So to me, that validated um, his personal decision to forego the benefits of those gifts and entertainment that, that business colleagues might offer to him so that he could focus his attention on doing the best job possible as a judge. And I think this, this is really to me, a good example of how a person can make an individual decision to forego a benefit or profits by, and establish an ethical reputation. But what really maintains and sustains that reputation is to uh, employ it consistently over a long period of time, which in my father's case, um, I believe he did. I think there's a second example that um, goes back much further in, in history that's also instructive in this regard, and it involves the founder of Lilly, Colonel Eli Lilly. He had been a pharmacist in Indianapolis before he enlisted in the Union Army and, and served in the military. And he returned to Indianapolis after the war and was really sobered by the number of soldiers who died from ineffective or even dangerous medicines that they were given. And as you know, in the 19th century, during the Civil War, medicine was, by our standards today at least, pretty primitive. What Colonel Lilly decided to do was to pursue um, the pharmaceutical business in a very different way from the way people had been tending to do it at that time. Because if you recall, we've all heard of patent medicines, and that was uh, a principal part of the way that medicines were offered to patients in, in the 19th century in the US. And the way it would work is that someone would come up with a formula, they patent it with the US Patent Office, 
They would sell it directly to patients, um, and they wouldn't tell them what was in it. Um, the, the manufacturing standards weren't really standards at all. It was sort of how much active ingredient you had or didn't have in a given batch. And the claims for these drugs were extravagant. Uh, whatever was, was missing in terms of ingredients was made, more than made up in the claims that these uh, people had for these products. So they treated everything. Colonel Lilly really wanted to approach it the business differently. He wanted to have the ingredients clearly listed on the label. He wanted to have high manufacturing standards so that every dose had the same amount of active ingredient one to the other. And he wanted to sell his products to pharmacists and physicians rather than directly to patients. And he went so far as to try to influence competitors in the Indianapolis area, what I think was a 19th century version of a trade association to, to likewise put the list of their ingredients on their, their products as well. And Colonel Lilly and several other leaders in um, this business in the 19th century became what was known as the ethical pharmaceutical industry in contrast to the patent medicine business. And so this, these were values that really infused the business and formed the foundation for his business and obviously formed a very strong foundation for the employees of Lilly because the stories about Colonel Lilly were told to employees from their first day at work and incorporated routinely into stories about the company and its history and the values to which the company adhered. But what I think is important to, to keep in mind about my father and Colonel Lilly is that it is much easier to make an ethical decision to impose limitations on yourself or on your wholly owned business than it is to um, impose those on a multinational corporation with many different and sometimes competing interests. And, and so that, to me, is, is an important point, that as an individual, you have a lot more flexibility about setting ethical standards for yourself. But it's not impossible to set those standards in, in a corporation. And I'd like to give you what is um, probably an unconventional example, but I think it really illustrates the point very clearly. And it involves Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, um, who at the time was the largest tenant in the World Trade Center. This was obviously prior to 9-11. To the story is from a book called The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley. It was published in 2008. And her story focuses on a man named Rick Rescorla, who was a Vietnam veteran and was hired by Morgan Stanley prior to 1993 to serve as their security uh, their head of security and, and safety. Even at the time he was hired, Rescorla was concerned that the World Trade Center towers would be an object of a terrorist attack. I don't know what led him to that conclusion, but he was concerned about it. And of course, his fears were validated in 1993, because that was when the first attack occurred on the World Trade Center. And he was actually there when the attack occurred and watched the evacuation of employees. And he was appalled. Uh, he, did, he saw chaos. He did not see a landlord that had a, a systematic way of evacuating employees from such a tall building. And the other th interesting thing that he noted is that people in an emergency got very polite. So people on upper floors would get in the stairwells and they would wait until everybody from the lower floors had cleared the stairwell before they would start down. And you can imagine how long it would then take people on the upper floors to be able to evacuate the building with that kind of a politeness. So after a 1993 attack, Rescorla went to his supervisors and said, this is really up to us. We've got to do something to protect employees in case there's another attack. And he proposed and management accepted a plan to put in place uh, regular drills and efforts to protect the employees so that they would understand how to evacuate the building in case of an attack. He had planned drills, he had uh, surprise drills, and you can imagine at Morgan Stanley when people, when time is money and people have big business deals and they're all in one of those amazing conference rooms looking out on the city of New York and the security person comes in in the yellow vest and says, we're having an emergency drill and you visitors as well as Morgan Stanley employees need to leave this um, deal discussion um, and walk down the flights of stairs and participate in our drill with us. But amazingly, he was successful in continuing this. When people began to get complacent and slow, he timed them. 
so that in eight years, those drills continued in spite of everything, and it paid off. Because on 9-11, 2,687 Morgan Stanley employees successfully and safely evacuated the building. Only 13 people died, including Rascorla and four of his security officers, and it was thought that they went back into the building to get stragglers and to help other people leave. According to the story, there was actually a senior vice president who refused to get off the phone and was in one of the offices and was one of the people that was lost. And so I hope that Rascorla wasn't going in just for that senior vice president. But in any event, thousands of people were saved and very likely because you had someone who was relentlessly focused on their safety. It's tempting in this story to focus just on Rascorla because he obviously had tremendous insight into um, terrorist thinking. He had insight into how to effectively and quickly evacuate people from such a big building. And he was clearly relentless. And so you have to give this man enormous credit for what he did for those employees. But just for a minute, I'd like to focus on some people who weren't highlighted in this story, but I think were critical to its success. And that's the senior leader at Morgan Stanley who made the initial decision, yes, we're going to have these drills. And then all the layers of management in that organization who clearly supported it um, by ensuring that their employees participated, by not undermining, by saying, look, you know, I know you all need to participate, but my team has a big deadline and they need to leave right away. Uh, or they need to stay here while you all leave. And uh, none of that apparently happened, or at least it didn't happen to the extent that it conflicted with the ultimate goal of being able to save all those employees during a terrible emergency. And, and so I think this really underscores a second point to me about uh, business ethics, is that the decisions in inherently involve some kind of limitation for the individual or the firm. And, and as a result of that, there has to be strong and consistent leadership from the top of the organization to reinforce that ethical principle over a period of time. And I'd argue the ethical principle here was going ab above and beyond what the landlord would otherwise do to protect those employees. Let's talk about another visionary leader. And, and his approach was a little different because um, with Sam Walton, with his vision being to provide the lowest cost products to uh, customers, first in rural parts of America and ultimately um, in most parts of America, um, that was really a business strategy. But he enhanced that business strategy by wrapping ethical uh, requirements for employees around it. And let me give you an example of that. It's one that I had occasion to have personal experience with. The employees who work with suppliers of Walmart have very stringent restrictions on accepting anything of value from those suppliers. And I'm sure at the time that this was put into place by Walmart, it was an anomaly. Today, most companies put limitations on the gifts, entertainment, and other uh, items of value that can be given to their employees by suppliers. But years ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. At Lilly, we had um, senior executives who were paired with Walmart executives, well, with customers um, that were critical to our US-based business. The, the goals of the program were to increase our understanding of other aspects of healthcare delivery, but also to build a relationship with the key customers so we could begin to have strategic discussions with them. And, um, this partnership with Walmart was especially important because Walmart obviously had the goal of bring, bringing the lowest cost products to their customers. Lilly's strategy was very different because we were spending up to a billion dollars to bring each new medicine out to patients. And so our goal was to be able to reinvest large amounts of money in research and, and drug development and to be able to introduce those products, but introduce them with uh, the protection of a patent. So we weren't interested in offering the lowest price of our patent-protected patent medicines um, in this kind of situation. But we did have a number of, of common interests around packaging, uh, supply distribution, and how you can begin to provide support to patients and other customers um, as, they're, as they're receiving their pharmaceuticals. So after a couple of years of the partnership and uh, visits by me down to Bentonville, Arkansas, we invited the team of senior 
uh, pharmacy leaders from Walmart to Indianapolis to meet with key leaders at Lilly in manufacturing and other areas of our business. And the plan was that they were going to fly in, we would have dinner together, and then the meetings would take place the next day. So I talked to the account executive and I said, I know Walmart has very, very low limits on meals, so let's figure out where we can have a nice dinner and, and be able to entertain this team. So we decided we'd do it at Chili's. We knew they liked Chili's, and there was a Chili's not, not too far from our house, and the bill can be very low at Chili's because Walmart will not reimburse for alcohol. So you can imagine that this was a, a very inexpensive meal at Chili's. And I said, well, to do something a little different, my house isn't far away, why don't they come over to my house after the dinner and we'll have coffee and I'm gonna bake a cake and we'll have coffee and cake. So she went back to the Walmart team and said, you're gonna come uh, to Indianapolis, we're gonna have dinner at Chili's and then we're gonna go to Ann's place for dessert. The Walmart team thought Ann's place was a restaurant, and so they arrived the day of the meetings, and they found out that Ann's place was my house, and they were panicked because they really can't accept anything of value, including coffee and a homemade cake. And but they also didn't want to offend me because they knew I'd gone to some trouble. So their solution was to pay more for the rental car that they were splitting with our account executive from Lilly, so they paid more for that and that enabled them to come to the house and have the cake and dessert. But, um, I, and we had a very nice discussion. It was, it was a good meeting and, and it worked out fine, but I obviously hadn't realized how stringent their restrictions were. But the thing that interested me was how proud the Walmart team was of those restrictions because they felt like that those restrictions enabled them to play a key role in helping their customers get lower cost products. Because obviously if a supplier can ply their representative with entertainment and gifts during the course of time, those negotiations over the contract the next time aren't gonna be quite as tough because you're dealing with somebody who's a friend and they've given you all these gifts. And Walmart wanted to make sure that that didn't happen because they wanted to be able to negotiate the lowest price possible for their customers. I'm sure at the time this went into place, Walmart employees were frustrated because they could identify their counterparts working for other retailers who were plied with all kinds of gifts. But it really became a point of pride for Walmart because what they did was enable every employee in the company to be able to see a way that they could contribute toward the, the business goal of offering the lowest price products uh, to their customers. And I think that this, is a, a, this illustrates to me a third principle of business ethics, which is you have to have the leadership from the top, but in order to really sustain an ethical position, you need every employee in the company aligned to it. You need them to understand what's expected of them, and that comes through, obviously, the leadership. It also comes from communication, from constant communication. It comes from training. And importantly, it comes from consequences for employees, and in Walmart's case, suppliers, who fail to comply with their rules. And, and so you need all those things in place so that every employee really understands the role that he or she plays and understands how to help implement the company's overall business strategy. So I want to focus now more closely on the issue of consistency because I think that that is, is really important. And as I said before, I think for a corporation, it's, it's often very hard to maintain it over a long period of time. My example again is Lilly. And so let me bring you from 19th century Lilly to 21st century Lilly, now one of the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, offering products throughout the world. Um, some of the products that Lilly has a long association with include insulin. Um, Lilly um, scientists actually worked with the uh, two scientists from Canada who realized that you could extract insulin, what, what was later learned to be insul or insulin from pancreatic glands and uh, administer that to people with, with uh, diabetes and, and treat it. And prior to that time, children who were born with type 1 diabetes um, were simply starved to death. That was the, considered the, the best treatment for them. And we have in the Lilly archives, or if you go to the um, entrance to the main building at Lilly in Indianapolis, there's a wonderful, um, very modern statue of a mother holding a child. And it's based on a photograph in our archives of a child who, 
whose mother brought him in for his first treatment for diabetes, who was skin and bones, and yet he was seven or eight years old. And you see him three months later after he's had the insulin, he's fat and looks like a, a normal child, and that's what happened. That was a miracle that happened with insulin. More recently, Lily was involved in developing the first uh, recombinant DNA form of insulin, and, and that was the first biotech product in the world. So Lily has a long history in, in diabetes. We've, we've been, had traditional strength in antibiotics, um, particularly going back to substantial manufacturing war production during World War II of penicillin, and then all, obviously involved in neuroscience with Prozac, um, and then more recently with uh, Zyprexa. So that gives you a little history of Lilly in the 21st century. Um, in January of 2009, um, and Pat alluded to this briefly, Lilly entered into a consent decree with the Office of Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services. That's quite a mouthful, but essentially what the Department of Health and Human Services has obviously many different functions, but it includes administering the Medicaid and Medicare programs, which are the largest single purchaser of drugs in the United States. The federal government is roughly 50% of drug uh, purchases depending on a company's product mix. But those are the two biggest programs. There are obviously many others, including um, programs for veterans and Indian um, affairs uh, organization that's purchasing on behalf of the health facilities on Indian reservations. But Medicare and Medicaid are the biggest ones. And um, the Office of Inspector General investigates situations where they believe that the federal government has been improperly charged for some form of health care um, that either wasn't indicated that is excessive or that shouldn't have been administered. Those are roughly the, the categories. In this case, the government alleged, and Lilly pled guilty to one misdemeanor count for uh, detailing one of its drugs off-label, and it, the drug was Zyprexa. Essentially, all of you have been to the pharmacy and gotten that uh, awful folded account, uh, accordion type of paper with microscopic print. That's the label. And among the other things it has in it is a description of exactly what the drug can be used for. And the FDA um, is very insistent that pharmaceutical companies can only talk within the four corners of that label. They, they cannot discuss what's called off-label or any kind of use of the drug that's not consistent with that label. And so that's what Lilly had pled guilty to. Um, the penalties included the penalties and fines totaled, and these were paid both the federal government to various state governments, $1.415 billion, a number I will never forget. And um, that was the largest single combined amount that had been paid at that point. Unfortunately for the pharmaceutical industry, two months later, another company paid an even bigger cumulative fine. But um, it was obviously a very large amount of money, and coupled with the fine penalties was a five-year corporate integrity agreement, which is an agreement with the Office of Inspector General that has very detailed prescriptions, proscriptions on activities that companies can engage in. It gives the government very broad powers to come in and observe the company business in the United States and so forth. And so that's, um, that's what Lilly pled guilty to. When that was announced, um, many, many of our employees around the world were distraught, very upset, and shocked by, by the settlement and by what the government alleged, as well as the, the actual agreement that we had uh, about the misconduct. Because it was so much at odds with what they had learned about the company from their first day at Lilly. And it, 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 Lilly had always prided itself on having very high standards, and employees couldn't understand how this could happen. One of the things I was pleased about is that when we discussed the agreement, when we issued a press release and our CEO um, did an interview on it, um, the focus was very much on contrition. Lilly had obviously been doing uh, a number of things for a number of years to correct this misconduct. So it's not like it started with the corporate integrity agreement. It had obviously been taking place for years before that. Um, but there was also a very clear message from Lilly that this was not something that we were proud of. Um, it wasn't behavior that we felt like was indicative of the values of the company and that as a company, both as a 
Eli Lilly and Company, and on behalf of all the employees, we resolved to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. And obviously, as part of that, we substantially uh, enhanced our ethics and compliance program, as, as you heard from uh, Pat's description. I think it's a fair question for you to ask, and, and I should add, too, that I, I focused on Lilly in this case because that's obviously a situation I was close to. I experienced it when I was there. Um, but this happened in nearly every other major pharmaceutical company, sometimes more than once. And so I think you could fairly ask the question, how is it that an industry that started in the 19th century as the ethical pharmaceutical industry, how could it end up in this much legal trouble with the federal government many years later? And I think that's a really complex question, and probably the answers um, uh, would be told uh, company by company rather than making broad generalizations. But let me mention a couple of things that I think may have contributed to it. I think one is that the industry has, had increasingly found itself into, in a very, very competitive uh, environment. And uh, particularly in therapeutic areas where uh, they were lucrative, but there were a number of players, it was tempting for companies to have ferocious competition and to really be paying attention to what the other companies were doing. That was part of it. I think the other part of it is that there was frustration at the time with the FDA, the feeling that the FDA was maybe uh, too slow in approving new drugs and too slow in approving new indications. Because if you go back to the comment I made about what is off-label, um, if you do research in a new use of the drug, you can go to the FDA and get approval to incorporate that into your label and then sell it for both uses. And companies do that often, and you can tell from the ads on TV when that happens, because uh, the company will have previously been talking about one use of the drug, and then they'll say, and it also treats this. And so that's when they get a new indication. Um, and while that frustration with um, uh, the FDA, you can understand maybe where it came from, I'd like to take the side of the FDA for just a minute and say, I think it's important for everyone and for companies to continue to remind their employees that the FDA plays an, a critical role in our society because you need one organization that has the absolute duty to put patients' interests at the very top and have an unbiased look at the data that a company presents. Now, all the companies of the pharmaceutical industry and the device industry pride themselves on their objectivity and their science. And there's no question that it's the best science out there. It's based on you know, work all over the world with preeminent scientists both inside the company and outside. But having led a global product development team earlier in my career, I also appreciate how much you get attached to a a molecule that you're developing, it becomes like a second or third child to you. And every time there's a positive study, you revel in the success. And when there's a negative study, you say, well, maybe we didn't design that study quite right. And I think it's a human reaction rather than anything that's unethical. It's just you, you become very attached to something you've put so much of yourself and your career in. And that's where the FDA plays an important role in being that a more impartial arbiter of the data to be able to say, does this benefit patients more than it might hurt them? And that's the basis on which the FDA judges. But this, this uh, prohibition on off-label uh, discussions can be particularly hard for one group of employees in a pharmaceutical company, and those are doctors. Doctors generally come to the industry after they've established a successful career in academia, um, in doing research, and in being someone who's looked to as an expert by their colleagues. And um, in that environment, when they are outside of the pharmaceutical industry as an employee or a contractor, they're free to say what they want to their colleagues, because doctors can prescribe legally off-label for any use that they deem appropriate. Um, but once a, one of those doctors works for the pharmaceutical company, they no longer operate under the rules for doctors. They operate under the rules for the industry. And I think that that can be really difficult for them when they feel a sense of urgency around sharing information, particularly in an area like uh, oncology, for example, where a patient may have exhausted every conventional treatment for oncology, um, the, their life is hanging in the balance, and a doctor may know, well, why don't you try this drug that hasn't been used in this before? And that conversation is fine as long as it's taking place outside of 
um, industry, but if the physician is, is from the industry, they can't say that about the products that, that their company is researching. And I think this highlights another, to me, important um, issue about business ethics, because I hear so often that companies can be ethical if they hire ethical employees. And, and at one level, that's true. I mean, you don't want to hire people who really are bent on breaking all the rules. But I don't think most people are. But I think the other thing you need to appreciate is that people can come into a company with very high standards that may differ from where, what the company's expectations are or actually create problems for the company. And this would include physicians who come into the industry and don't appreciate that, that a different set of rules apply to them. And I think that um, it's incumbent upon companies to recognize where these conflicts might occur and make sure that they're providing the education and the background and explaining to employees why it is that within the company they need to adhere to a different set of standards. Um, and another example that comes up with multinational corporations frequently is, is doing business outside the United States and having to operate within the requirements of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. This is the anti-corruption enhancement that I was mentioned by Pat in my introduction. Because in, in this particular case, you, you can have a situation in a country where it's commonly accepted that gifts are given on certain occasions to um, customers. And it's perfectly acceptable in that culture. Or you could have a, 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 uh, environments where it's accepted that um, new contractors that are engaged by the company are the companies owned by relatives, friends, or people connected to the government. And, and within that culture, that is something that's accepted. But under US law, it can become extremely problematic if what you're ending up doing is appearing to give a gift or some kind of uh, item of value to a government employee or you're engaging in commercial bribery. Again, this is an environment where it takes a lot of careful thought about how is it that you can meet cultural expectations and avoid the appearance of, of a bribe. It, it also means educating both the US-based employees and the employees from other countries about what the company's rules and expectations are and how to meet those. And, and that, that requires some delicacy, it requires some tact, but it's essential that companies do it because otherwise people will come in and operate based on the values that they've brought to the company and won't realize that something they're doing is putting the company at risk. So I, I, this is an area of making sure that employees understand not only what's expected of them, but, but why it's expected of them and why it ties in with the company's overall either compliance program or their ethical aspirations. What I, I've described to you today are um, how a company's ethical framework can be built. And, and I have certainly left things out of this ethical framework. I know that some uh, commonly include corporate social responsibility within a company's ethics, but I've really tried to confine myself to a, a very specific part of ethics where I think there's the opportunity to sustain those principles over a long period of time and build them into the reputation of the individual or the company. It's obviously easier if it's an individual to be able to apply those standards to himself or herself or his or her business if, if he or has direct control of the business, but it's not impossible for a large corporation to do it. It takes strong and consistent leadership from the top. And, and the other part I'd add about the leadership is that in order to sustain through generations of leadership, you have to be able to tell the original stories over and over again, but you also need to incorporate traditional or contemporary examples with that so that employees are hearing not only the history of the company, but they're able to see what the history of the company looks like today in terms of those ethical principles. So that's the, what needs to happen in terms of the stories at a senior level, but obviously at every level of management, um, you need to see um, leaders acting consistently with those ethical positions because if they're not, they undermine them very quickly with employees and in turn with other stakeholders. The stories are important, the leadership is important, but you've got to couple it with the communications, the training, and consequences for employees if they, if they fail to meet those requirements. At this point, you probably are listening to this and thinking, well, I, I can see how I can apply these if I become an entrepreneur 
or I see what might happen years down the road um, if I move into a senior leadership in a company, but how does it really apply to me today? And I would argue it applies um, as much today to your careers as you join a business as it will uh, 20, 30, 40 years down the road as you see your career coming to a very successful conclusion. You have the opportunity that a generation ago we didn't have, which is the opportunity to really learn and think deeply about business ethics. That wasn't something that you heard much about a generation ago. And I think it's been a combination of uh, sort of so many examples of bad behavior, but also the fact that, that key um, people in business have begun to, to insist that business schools focus on ethics, that there's a focus in companies on ethics. There are or multinational organizations that are establishing uh, ethical principles and encouraging companies to align with those, like the UN Global Compact. And, and so there are, there's just a lot more talk about ethics. And what I would encourage is that as you look at potential employers, you first examine your own ethical principles, and then look at the company to see how your, your ethics will mesh with that company's. And it's going to require some work on your part. I think an internship is the single best way to find out about a company. But if you don't have that opportunity, I encourage you to read about the company, to um, talk to current and former employees if you have that opportunity, and find out what um, current employees say about their ethics and compliance. Uh, programs are they? Do they take it seriously, or are they sort of making fun of it? Um, because I think you can get some real insight into the culture of the organization. Once you join a company, I would really encourage you to embrace the company's ethics and and really embody them in all the interactions you have on behalf of the company with stakeholders. It's very hard on day one when they just inundate you with training and uh, the compliance program and the code of conduct. So it's hard to absorb, but if you spend the time to do it, I think you can um, really get off to a very fast start in a company and be able, over time, to help shape um, the culture of that company and reinforce its, its ethical values. You may have the opportunity, too, to join a company whose reputation has been damaged and needs to be restored. And I think with the training you've had here, coupled with really being thoughtful about what the company does and, and how you can enhance it, you, you have an opportunity to help companies regain public trust and restore a damaged reputation. And maybe the most exciting of all would be to build your own company, whether you do it like Colonel Lilly and you have certain ethical principles that are the foundation for your business, or like Sam Walton, you take a business strategy and you, you reinforce it with ethical principles. I think that there are tremendous opportunities uh, for people today to do that and for those companies to be very successful. And through those efforts, you have the ability to revolutionize a whole industry, as Colonel Lilly and his peers did, establishing the ethical pharmaceutical industry. But you also have the opportunity to change retailing like Sam Walton did. And, and these are the opportunities that I think uh, your generation has to be able to shape companies and make them um, much more trusted partners with consumers and other stakeholders um, so that um, business operates more effectively, more transparently, and, and that you get the tremendous satisfaction from having been able to shape a company during the course of your career. So I wish you well, and I will enjoy watching your success. Thank you. We have a, thank you, Kat. You're welcome. We have an interesting microphone situation. Going to work here? Oh. Just know how this is going to work. Uh, we'll start with Father Williams. So, uh, thank you for a very helpful presentation on thank ethics. You. As we talked earlier, I'm on the board of the UN Global Compact. I'd be interested. To, uh, has Lily found that helpful in in, in uh, managing their ethical issues? Yes, I, it 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 has been helpful to Lily, and I think that it's going to be helpful to 
more companies as they understand the principles that are in the Global Compact and they begin to look at their competitors. I think this is a great area where competition is really going to help because if companies begin to see that all their peers are, are members of the Global Compact and are adhering to those principles, I think it will encourage others to join. So I'm very hopeful that it will set uh, a high standard. I think that the important thing, though, is that each company really needs to understand how its business strategy can be enhanced for a, a sustainable period of time by the ethical principles to which it aspires. I think in some cases, companies are sort of grabbing for things right now that, that give it the, the halo of ethics, but that aren't probably set, set up within the company to be sustainable. And so I really hope the Global Compact will become part of that sustainable foundation for companies to establish their ethical principles. Pat, you're having to do a lot of work for something that's supposed oh, to be tossed. I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah, um, with Cytrexa, uh, looking at it, it looks like uh, Lily was accused of ghostwriting which was that the company wrote the scientific documents, then forced doctors to sign it, and then the Zyprexa death rates uh, amongst dementia patients was 3.5%, whereas the placebo was 1.5%. So it seems more like they were lying to get profits as opposed to the FDA not approving it fast enough. Like, do you feel this is a systematic issue where boards of directors should be fired? Um, yeah, there are three questions there. Let me, let me start with the ghostwriting thing because I think that, that at Lilly there were always very high standards for how articles would be written, but there were people who were professional writers who were employed to help support the scientists writing articles and they would help develop the, the, the articles. I think that, that in any collaborative effort to write articles, it's often hard to say, who is it that's taking the lead on writing the article and what kind of flexibility do people have you know, to change words around in an article? But um, I think certainly as a result of those allegations, everybody in the industry has made substantial changes and been much more transparent about the role that each person plays in making sure that people aren't listed as authors who don't put in a certain amount of work into the writing of the article. And I think part of that was the industry needed to tighten up how it ascribed those roles and, and, and it been more transparent about the fact that there were writers helping. They weren't driving the content, but anytime somebody's writing, um, you need to be clear about the role that people are playing. So I think that that is, is what's going on in terms of what used to be called ghost writing. And I think now um, my understanding is, and of course I've been retired for the last couple of years, but um, that today there's much more transparency and much more rigidity about who can be included in an article and who can't. Given that it's, it's a sign of uh, prestige to be associated with an article, there was obviously a lot of pressure in the past to include people who felt like they ought to be entitled to be, part of, to, to be one of the lead authors and hadn't contributed as much to the content. So that kind of thing has stopped. Um, there's no question that the guilty plea that Lilly entered into related to detailing um, uh, Zyprexa to people who suffered from dementia. And um, at the time that the, that detailing began, Lilly had studies underway to look at, at um, uh, the use of Zyprexa with dementia because it was felt that atypical antipsychotics might be helpful in treating dementia. It was subsequently realized that um, that it didn't work in that case. And I think that this is an example of where uh, somebody was detailing something that had not been included in the label. And it's, it's, it's not right, and it shouldn't have been done. And that's what Lily said, is that it's not doing that again. It's making very sure in all of its processes that no one is out talking about research that's underway until that research has been submitted to the FDA, approved, and, and incorporated into the label. And your last question was? I think you answered it. Did I get it? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. It's pretty cool. Um, I have two questions. First of all, uh, question one is, I'd like to know a little bit about what Eli Lilly's done to advance 
the UN Millennium Goals. And the second one is when Eli Lilly was entering into the compact, we were, uh, this came up in our class, we were wondering if there was concern that being a member might increase the potential of litigation for the company? I'll answer your second question first. I think that <laughs> anything you do um, in, within a pharmaceutical company, um, and especially a company that has a number of lawyers, there's gonna be a concern about potential litigation. And so I think that, that that's something that, that the company always works through. And I think that's true for all major companies today, is that you worry about litigation, you look at um, what, what's the risk and how can you avoid that as best you can and still move the business forward and meet the business goals. So um, I think it's an ever-present concern, honestly. Litigation, not just about that, but about pretty much everything um, that you undertake. And um, I, I don't think I'm in the best position, because the, the work around um, the UN Global Compact and um, uh, those goals was handled more by the corporate affairs organization. It was not part of ethics and compliance. I don't have as much insight into your first question because it's been obviously a number of years since I was directly involved in the work on um, the UN Global Compact and the corporate social responsibility. Maybe our receivers will do that well Saturday. Hi, thank you very much for the, the talk today. I have a, more of a general question about mm -hmm. the industry rather than specifically about Eli. I've uh, done a couple of projects, done some research on uh, Gilead and their recent pricing issues with uh, Savaldi and, and the derivatives of that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the ethics of balancing, you know, recouping the large investments into drugs and the R&D cost with how you go out and price a drug, a particularly one like Savaldi, uh, you know, which has pushed all other alternatives out of the market. Uh, how, just how do you think about that as a company? What, how you balance the ethics of pricing versus meeting market needs? I think it's one of the hardest questions out there because um, as it's gotten more and more difficult to um, identify a, a, a promising molecule and, and get it all the way to FDA approval, I think that's put more and more pressure on companies in terms of the products they bring out and what they do about pricing. I think for a member of the public to look at the price of some of these drugs and say, how can they possibly charge, I think, what is it, $10,000 a dose, something like that? It's about, uh, about $95,000 per treatment. For right. course of treatment and, and quite a lot for, per dose. And I think that's very hard for, for um, people to imagine what to do about it. And um, that problem is clearly going to continue, I think, in the short term, because companies are coming out with drugs um, and they're, they're, they, they perceive that the um, window in which they have to sell their drug is getting smaller and smaller. Um, one thing I would say, this is something that, that I've thought about, it's not something that came from Lilly at all, but I think one of the uncertainties for pharmaceutical companies today is about patent validity because companies have seen patents being invalidated for um, reasons that seem, after the fact, from the company standpoint, to be arbitrary. They may or may not be, but you know, Lilly, for example, lost its Prozac patent earlier than it anticipated. And the, the legal scheme right now encourages the generic firms to challenge the patents. And so the risk is very great around um, you know, constructing your patent in a way and patenting your product in a way that can protect it. Um, I think that getting um, method of, I mean, uh, getting uh, periods of exclusivity in place that would be granted at the time a product becomes approved. There, are, there is exclusivity of data that you submit to the FDA for a period of five years right now. In Europe, it's 10. And I think a, a, a scheme like that might be, provide more predictability to companies and might help reduce some of this pressure. But it is a very difficult question, and I don't think there are any easy answers to it. Um, but um, certainly, you get concerned when you've got products that are priced to such an extent in the U.S. that patients in the U.S. can't get them, but what is a problem in the U.S. is an even greater problem outside the U.S. I think there you see companies trying more and more to find ways to provide the products in, uh, in developing countries, at least in some cases, as long as they're not seeing those products get 
reimported into the major markets. But um, all of it is, is, it's a very difficult problem. And I think you've got a problem overall with healthcare in the United States and the cost of healthcare. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And I'm sure Anne will stay after if anybody has any individual questions they'd like to ask her. But uh, please join me in uh, thanking Anne for making the trek up from Indianapolis today to South Bend to be with us. Thank you so much, Anne.